first of all, uh, what in the world is a community college your size doing in a hundred million dollar conversation? You and I have talked <laughs> over the years that, you know, uh, community colleges certainly don't have all the resources they need. There's resource limitations. And I think when somebody says a number like that and the partners you mentioned, they're like, oh, you know, that's great for him, but what about us? But what I would love for you to talk to uh, the folks about is how that comes to pass. I think a lot of people don't understand. They, they see the end result, like an announcement like that, but they don't understand what's required to partner, to, to build relationships, to sell the case, if you will, that Motlow can be one of the platforms and one of the key players in this. And I think that's where a lot of leaders you know, they look to their legislature or they look to, you know, uh, whatever's happening in their traditional funding sources, but they don't necessarily put partnerships out there as a goal. So I want you to come back to that and tell us a little bit about how that came to be. On the virtual reality and the simulations and working with augmented reality, again, that makes absolutely no sense for where you're located historically. How did you get there, right? How did you convince folks that that was going to be something that immediately would be able for you to preserve community, but work in an industry that's largely virtual, which I believe we're gonna to have to wrestle with coming out of this vaccination period where it's okay to live in an area, pay your taxes there, take advantage of uh, the great sense of community, the great vibrancy of that community, but have a job that works any hours anywhere in the world. And you can be flexible around your family situations. I think that's that's going to make you more competitive, Michael, not less. And I know you share that same view. And then the last piece would be this, this notion of Uncle Nearest and, you know, black and brown wealth and closing the wealth gap, not only by telling that story to the world and making sure people know about it, but also establishing a pipeline right through Motlow where those workers can become, you know, whatever they want to be in the future with learning how to run distilleries, be a part of them, expand them, et cetera. And so those are three great stories that I know you've told me individually, but I'd love for you to just spend a minute talking about how they came to be like, because I think people hear them and they go, well, of course he, he's fortunate. And, you know, our community college is not like that but yours wasn't always either. So I'd like for you to tell the listeners a little bit about how you get there, how you begin on those types of partnerships. Relationships uh, are key to any short-term and long-term uh, success, uh, as well as it's okay. And people need to hear that it's okay that some relationships lead to long-term and short-term failure. And that long-term and short-term failure are also okay because it also leads you down this rabbit hole to where someone says, you know what? They stuck with us when we didn't have, they stuck with us when we were trying to figure it out. And so let's get something done. And we want them as a partner because we know that it doesn't matter if it's just about success, it's about making an impact in our communities. So the first one, um, this conversation has been going on for, for a long time. Uh, I'll say that, I'll say a long time. When you have that many partners involved, um, I think it began with a conversation when I was talking with one of the principals of the, the land trust themselves. And I talked about the importance of sustainability for them. Uh, the world that I leave behind for my children and my grandchildren is, is at the forefront of a lot of things I think about first thing in the morning and at night. Um, did I turn off all of the lights? Did I unnecessarily use or waste resources? Did I turn the water off and, and, and instead of just letting it run when I was cleaning the dishes. I know it seems like a silly thing, but long-term, if we all just leave the water running, that's a shortage, maybe not in my generation or my kid's generation, but maybe it impacts someone else. So I just trying to do my part, but the relationship component about the land trust, it was about having that conversation about, we have 187 acres at Motlow that was bequeathed to us by uh, Rager Motlow, who is the grand nephew or nephew of Jack Daniel. And so because we have all of this land, I was just thinking about, it'd be nice to have a space where our employees and our community could, could come to walk. And you remember those parks when we were kids, you could walk through them. They were well lit. You could do pull-ups, you could do sit-ups. Uh, they were using wooden um, and, and metal uh, exercise stops. Uh, and they were usually like a quarter mile or 
mm-hmm. uh, three fourths of a mile away from each other. And I thought about the bucolic setting that we that we have in Moore County, and I thought that that would be smart to do. So out of this came more conversations that surrounded energy, sustainability, et cetera. And, and so we ended up getting to here. This is the end result of talking about just simply having a space to walk and the importance of sustainability. Um, with the XR and VR spaces, um, you know, I've been I've been teaching or had been teaching uh, prior to you know, taking this on uh, mm-hmm. since 2015, mm-hmm. using virtual reality and tying my English courses to a Shark Tank style entrepreneurial final project, uh, where my students would be asked the first day, every day you come in here, be mindful that we're going to go in VR. But what are we going to do? You're going to go in VR. You're going to see stories that are tied to our outcomes, objectives, and goals for the course. And I don't want you to just write about what you read and hear. I want you to write about what you experience in this space. So for for those who want data, I've got data about how the course uh, kept students in it. You know, typically in community college, English courses, 10, 10, and 10, 20s, first and second year, you lose about six to seven students. So you go from 22 to 16 or 22 to some number that's like, where do these kids go? And adults, where do they go? I know that my teaching didn't get better, Brian, Mm. but my engagement tool was different enough uh, that students said, I like this. Every day we come in, we grab a headset that's provided for us. We put our phone in. The Within app was free and is free. And we jump in it and we tie this to what we're doing in the course. Now, I I, I will say that just like in any organization, any course, everything's never perfect. It's Mm. never going to be perfect. So there were students that were like, well, I didn't sign up for this. So that's why we do it the first day. Got them into the course that they wanted to be in so they could do it the traditional organic way that we've always done English courses. But the XR Academy bore out of that. And I often saw the use of that virtual space and scape as a way to kind of indulge uh, the students as well with going beyond the common, just looking at the flat text, uh, but actually being immersed into this text, into the story. So uh, it, 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 it turned out well uh, and did that for several years. Uh, lastly, um, the Uncle Nearest opportunity came out because of asking uh, Fawn Weaver to come and visit me. And I, I think we had a, a one hour conversation. And uh, I think lots of times people are expecting you to ask them for something. Mm-hmm. And my preference is to show a proof of concept, uh, to exercise and explain who we are. Mm-hmm. And then she invited me for barbecue one day and said, hey, I want to do this with you. And she said, how much, how much do you need? I said, I don't need anything. We're going to build it for you first. Mm-hmm. And then we'll come back to you and say, this is what we need. So uh, that approach has worked for us. And it is good fortune. It is being in the right place at the right time. But I also believe that um, relationships are like painting a fence. Um, yeah. when you paint a fence for those who painted at all, painted fence. There's always a nook and a cranny that you go back and you look, I know I covered that, but you have to go back and do it again. And you have to do it again. And you have to do it again. So being consistent and, and being as solid of an object as or an organic human can be, I think that's important in this relationship building too. So much uh, wisdom there in terms of, you know, this great James Comer quote I use a lot where no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. And one of the things that I've always valued about you and your team is your, your, your learners first. And, and that's, that can be tough, right? You know, people rise to a certain level or a certain position within their career and they get caught up in maybe their expertise is enough. And what I love about you is you're, you're restless, you're curious, you're you're not (laughs) satisfied with, with where Motlow is or where your own growth and development is or your children. And I know we talk a a lot about our families and we talk about, you know, our team as families. And I think one of the things I really valued about, you know, this past year was we touched based uh, you know, several times during the pandemic. And then you gave me an opportunity to come in with your senior staff and kind of, you know, lunch and learn and discuss together what we saw about the future. And I'm just excited for you when I hear these stories and 